Hello, everybody. Okay, so this uh, uh, lecture in materials is uh, covered under a Creative Commons license that allows it to be freely uh, shared and redistributed. So do with it whatever you like. So I'm going to give you a uh, follow up on your uh, lectures from yesterday. We're going to talk a little bit um, at a deeper depth on uh, pathway and network analysis. Um, most of the examples I'll show are, are drawn from cancer, but everything I talk about is applicable to any model system or disease process. So the objectives for this uh, module are to understand uh, the landscape of pathway and network analysis. We, well, I'm only going to touch very briefly on individual tools and try to talk about the principles underlying them. We're going to talk about where pathway and network data comes from, how it's collected, what the reliability of the various sources are, the analytic approaches to data analysis, how you visualize and integrate it, uh, and uh, talk about some applications of uh, pathway enrichment analysis. So you probably know why uh, we're interested in pathway analysis, and that's why you're here. Uh, it's because high throughput data is very multidimensional and hard to grasp when you're sequencing thousands of genomes and tens of thousands of genes, uh, it can be very difficult to interpret the, the results of experiments, such as uh, perturbation experiments. By uh, uh, projecting this multidimensional data onto a smaller number of biological pathways, you've done two things. You've increased the statistical power of your analysis by reducing the number of hypotheses from the thousands to the, the dozens. Um, and you're um, uh, uh, able to tell biological stories, uh, such as identifying hidden patterns in gene lists or creating uh, predictive models to explain your observations. Uh, and you can do such things as uh, uh, predict the function of annotated genes based on where they associate in um, in the pathway. Uh, so uh, this is a very broad type category. Uh, pathway network analysis is is um, broadly defined as any analytic technique that makes use of bio, of uh, biological pathway or molecular network information to gain uh, insights into a biological system. Uh, it's a very large and rapidly evolving uh, field with many different many different competing approaches. But, but basically, to do any of these uh, tests, you need two ingredients. You need your data, uh, high throughput biological data, um, such as altered genes, proteins, RNAs in a derived from an experiment, and you need a uh, information source of uh, known pathways and and networks. Now, what do I mean when I talk about pathways versus networks? Um, you, uh, I think you probably covered this yesterday, but a pathway is a uh, ordered collection of genes uh, with their relationships uh, uh, laid out, genes or other macromolecular entities. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, a simplified version of the first steps of the uh, uh, EGFR pathway with the uh, its ligands, the receptor, uh, and the first dimerization step, and it's laid out in a biologically um, uh, intuitive manner, which reflects the the way we think about biological pathways. In contrast, uh, a network uh, consists of uh, less well understood relationships. Uh, um, among uh, among the various actors. And the, the main feature of this is that it's not semantically or, uh, 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 ordered. Uh, so you can't as easily look at this and try to figure out where the start and end of it is. The network is actually probably more like what the cell sees. It doesn't, it doesn't recognize sequences of events. Um, but the pathway is an easier way to understand it um, for our limited uh, minds. So there are pathway databases and network databases, and some which have both. 
Um, pathway databases um, have the advantage of usually being curated. Typically, they're uh, created by a team of curators and authors who scour the literature and reduce uh, the uh, experimental findings into a textbook style uh, view of biological processes. Um, they offer have the advantage of offering a human interpretable visualization of the pathway and tools that make use of the uh, cause and effect uh, along the pathway. Uh, the disadvantages of these is that they don't cover the genome very well. The best pathway databases maybe cover half of the genome. They, they are always a little bit uh, out of date because they're waiting for the review article that, that comes in with a big summary of the pathway. And so they're going to be missing latest knowledge. And uh, a bigger problem is that each database has a, has a different idea of where a pathway starts and ends. Um, so they'll have the pathways will have different names and they'll have different uh, different constituents. So it can be hard to relate the results from one pathway database to another. Uh, a typical um, uh, uh, pathway database, tip, typical pathway databases are Reactome and Keg. Uh, I'll be talking about Reactome a lot because I'm one of the PIs uh, for the Reactome and uh, initially conceived of it many years ago. Um, these both these databases explicitly describe uh, biological processes as a series of ordered biochemical reactions. Uh, here is the basic reactome model. Keg uses a similar model where the core uh, of every step is a reaction. It has a series of inputs, and uh, the reaction transforms them into a series of outputs. And along the way, there can be uh, uh, regulatory molecules or enzymes and catalytic activities which affect the uh, um, affect the rate of the reaction. Uh, and this basic model can cover a whole variety of things: proteins, small molecules, complexes, and even such things as um, changes in the topological location of a macromolecule. So, for example, if there's a transporter step in which a uh, small molecules moved from the cytosol into the interstitial space, they're going to be um, an input, which is the small molecule inside the cytosol, and an output, which is a small molecule in the interstitial space, and each of them is treated as a, as a separate related object. So um, an example, a very popular example, is KEG, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. This is a huge library of information on hundreds of species. It contains the genome, the fully sequenced genomes of many species, proteins, pathways, chemical compounds, diseases. Uh, and part of KEG is its pathway collection. And that's a collection of manually drawn pathway maps representing uh, knowledge on um, uh, uh, spanning metabolism, cellular processes, human diseases uh, and drug interactions. Uh, the keg is partially open. You can browse it um, for free, um, but if you require, want to do data analysis on it or download it, you need to pay a, an annual subscription fee for it. Uh, and this should be kind of a familiar picture. There will see a lot of these. This is the keg version of the cell cycle. One of the unique features of KEG is that each of its options. Oh, okay. I'm getting sorry. I'm getting a message here. Uh, I don't know if that was meaningful. Um, the uh, one of the uh, key features of it is that it, each of its genes is identified by its uh, enzymatic enzymatic activity using its EC number. Okay, Reactome. Um, is uh, complete open source and completely open access. There, um, it is free to it is free to use. It's free to download. You can set up mirrors of it. You can create your own reactome. Uh, it is a twenty year old project um, that uh, was I I initiated with you and Bernie from the uh, European yeah. Bioinformatics Institute, um, and uh, it is a pathway database encompassing metabolism signaling and many other biological processes. 
Uh, it has a team of uh, about a half dozen uh, curators who work with authors in the field to curate paper literature uh, uh, reports um, in a machine readable format. Every single statement is supported by a uh, supported by the primary literature and it cross references many other informatics databases. Uh, it has a series of data visualization and an analysis tools built into it, with all, uh, as well as being available uh, as um, uh, R and uh, uh, Python and uh, libraries uh, and a series of desktop tools. Uh, it provides a Google Map style uh, interactive reaction diagram. Uh, it has textbook style illustrations with uh, clickable overlays, uh, and it lets you do things like find the pathways, you give it a gene list, you can find the pathways which can, um, uh, which your genes are participating in. You can calculate the overrepresentation of uh, genes or proteins in a pathway, and you can do mapping from one species to another. So this is a, a, a typical uh, reactome page. I've ser searched here for cell cycle. I get a little picture that was drawn by uh, one of the curators or an author uh, and, a, uh, and a human readable summary of that pathway. Underneath that, I can dig into it and I can start getting into the uh, detailed um, pathway diagram. Again, this is interactive and allows you to perform analysis directly on the, on the diagram and a lot of database fields. The, um, so we'll go into Reactome a little bit more later, but now I'm gonna to switch to networks. So in contrast to a pathway, networks are much less attractive, they, they, but very, very information dense. Uh, so whereas pathways capture only the well understood portion of biology, things that could go into a review paper, uh, networks cover uh, high throughput data and less well understood relationships, including things like genetic interactions, you knock down a gene in yeast and something and uh, the expression level of another gene changes. We know they're related in some way, but we have no idea what the mechanism is, but we know there's an interaction between them. Physical interactions, such as experiments in which you do a co-immunosuppressive precipitation to develop, uh, uh, to get lists of complexes. We know that all the genes, all the proteins in that complex interact with each other. We don't exactly know uh, what, uh, what, their, um, what their role is. Co-expression data, gene ontology term sharing, their adjacency and pathways, anything that describes a uh, a, a bimolecular relationship can be put into a network. So network databases can be built via, built via curation, and many are. They can also be built automatically from high throughput experiments. They have uh, extensive coverage of biological systems. They may cover um, the vast, the majority of uh, human genes, um, but the relationships and uh, the underlying evidence between the uh, uh, underneath these interactions is much more tentative. And one of the problems with networks is they, they tend to have a lot of false positives. Um, there are a series of, um, uh, cur of curated networks that, that in which uh, some of the false positives have been removed by uh, applying strict uh, standards for evidence gathering. Um, the ones that uh, uh, I tend to use are BioGrid, which is a uh, uh, has uh, interactions from 80 different species and has 2.6 million interactions among 87,000 genes. Uh, Intact, which is one of the Euro which is a, a European uh, bioinformatics institute project that uh, a Reactome collaborates with quite um, uh, quite uh, strongly. Uh, this has 9,000 species and 1.2 million interactions. Uh, and then uh, uh, locally, Gene Mania, which is one of Gary Bader's uh, projects, um, is a compendium of uh, 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 2,800 gene association networks representing 660 million interactions across nine species. Um, and um, uh, I'll give you a little look at that, uh, a little look at that later. 
So here's a typical uh, search on intact. Uh, I searched for uh, everything that interacts with TP53 uh, and uh, it found um, uh, uh, something like 9,000 different interactions, which I then filtered down to uh, a smaller number of physical interactions that I, I, I could visualize. And it's showing the interaction graph here. I don't know how well that shows up. You can't see the lines very well on that screenshot, unfortunately. Um, and then with this, you can do things like um, given a uh, given a uh, a gene list that you've come up with, uh, identify pathways that contain them uh, or, or networks that contain them both, and see how far they are uh, far away they are from each other. Gene mania is uh, has a much better visualization than either intact or biogrid, so it's the one I tend to use when I can. Uh, it has um, uh, 2,800 uh, um, networks that have been brought into a framework um, in which you can uh, do a, a variety of things. But the most interesting thing is, is, is if you have a gene list of, say, a dozen genes, it will, um, uh, it will create a network for you that contains those genes in your list as well as other genes that are necessary to link them together. So it allows you very rapidly to search through it and find potential, uh, potential pathways among them, things that relate your genes. Uh, and you can select the type of network to interrogate. You can look at only genetic networks or genetic plus physical networks. Uh, or things that are related by gene ontology terms or co-expression terms. It's a very flexible and very useful tool for doing data exploration. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, the what the uh, visualization analysis tool landscape is for um, biological networks. Um, there are a series of a series of um, desktop tools that are very useful. Uh, Visant, which is shown on the left, is uh, designed um, particularly for metabolic um, interaction networks, and it builds up uh, color coded um, uh, 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 color coded by function um, um, networks of uh, uh, that contain a, a, a gene set of interest. Uh, Navigator is uh, is similar, but it gives you a three D view. And you can rotate uh, it, uh, a 3D representation of your um, uh, of the network that you've built up, and then Cytoscape, which I think you're all familiar with, does pretty much everything that you that you might want, and has a very rich ecosystem of plugins that provide uh, both simple to a very advanced network analysis. So let's um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types of pathway network analysis that you may see. There are basically three types of um, uh, uh, modeling tools. So one is, um, the, the most basic one is uh, gene set enrichment analysis. In this, um, uh, in this type of analysis, you have a uh, a set of genes that came from a high throughput experiment, such as a, uh, an, a, a RNA expression experiment, where you've got some genes which are in what were uh, upregulated and other genes which were downregulated, for example. Um, uh, and what these tools do is it divides the uh, um, divides the uh, biology into a series of bags. Of pathway bags, all the genes that are involved in cell cycle, all the genes that are involved in apoptosis, all the genes that are involved in immune signaling, uh, and identify uses uh, 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 there are a number of algorithms which are able to identify genes which are uh, overrepresented or pathway, uh, pathways which are overrepresented in your gene set uh, to give you a sense of what biological processes have been changed in your experiment. And so this is these tools are essential for taking a large uh, large data set and identifying the um, uh, um, identifying the biological processes which may be altered 
in that, um, uh, in that experiment. The second one um, is, uh, is used more for discovery. Um, these are um, uh, uh, subnetwork uh, 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 construction and clustering modules where you have a, uh, uh, you have a gene set of interest and you want to construct a network which relates them. And this is useful for uh, finding new pathways that are altered in, uh, in cancer or my disease, or identifying uh, clinically relevant tumor subtypes, which differ by which pathways or which subnetworks are activated in that, um, in that disease process. And finally, the, the, the most sophisticated and hardest to use of these tools are ones which do pathway-based modeling. And these can actually construct, use the information in an underlying pathway or network database to construct a model of your bio, of the biological process such that you can make predict you can make predictions on it. So having analyzed, for example, a, uh, a single cell uh, perturbation experiment in which a series of genes in a pathway were knocked up or knocked down, you see what the effect downstream of uh, the, the downstream effects of that uh, perturbation. These systems will build a model which then allows you to predict uh, new biology, what happens when you knock up or knock down a gene which was not in your experimental data set. So these are used are for things like uh, prediction, uh, precision medicine prediction in uh, patients. If I give this patient a drug, given um, uh, their, uh, uh, their mutation profile, do I expect that drug to be effective? Okay, so let's talk a little, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about these, these techniques. Um, so enrichment of fixed gene sets, I believe you have covered that uh, yes, yesterday. Uh, but just as a reminder, this is the single most popular form of pathway network analysis. Um, there are two bifurcations in this. There's simple algorithm representation analysis in which you have to choose a threshold when uh, um, uh, between a uh, threshold in your data set. So for example, in a expression data set, you have to set a threshold for which genes are upregulated versus which genes are downregulated. So you have two bins. And then it'll tell you, it'll find pathways or, uh, or uh, pathways which are overrepresented in the upregulated set. The problem and with overrepresentation analysis is you have to choose the threshold. Uh, and uh, it's not always obvious how to do that. Functional class scoring, which the exemplar of that is a GSEA, which I think you used yesterday. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, does, um, uh, ranks pathway uh, ranks the pathways by the degree of overrepresentation in the data set, and provides a kind of a, a the ability to to form a, a, a continuous function uh, across them. Doesn't require you to find the threshold, um, and gives you a um, a, a series of, of of p values and false discovery rates for the for the pathways of interest. The advantages of both these techniques are they're easy to perform and they have lots of good end user tools. And the statistical models are very well worked out. They give you accurate, pretty much accurate false discovery rates and p-values. Uh, disadvantages of any of these systems is there's a fundamental assumption that you can take the, take human biology and partition it into non-overlapping sets of pathways. And we know that isn't uh, so that you have a series of bags. And we know that isn't true. Pathways are heavily overlapping. Um, and in fact, when you use any of these tools, you usually get um, a series of, uh, uh, of overlapping enriched pathways, which contain some of the same genes. And you have to apply additional tools in order to try to figure out what is an independent observation and what is, uh, um, what is uh, uh, not. Um, nevertheless, this is where most people uh, start, and it's adequate for the vast majority of uses. So here is an example of pathway enrichment done with Reactome's online tools. 
Um, you um, go to the Reactum website and click on analysis. You get a page like this, which offers a variety of uh, online tools. The simplest one is uh, the uh, gene set enrichment analysis in which you cut and paste a list of genes um, and uh, um, optionally a list of values associated with them, such as expression levels. Um, here, I've cut and paste a list of genes that were taken out of COSMIC, which is a cancer pathway database, which is a list of cancer-associated genes uh, to see where um, uh, all the COSMIC genes fall on a, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the pathway map. And this is one of the visualization uh, results that you get from this analysis. This is a, 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 a Voronoi plot. Um, of the, or also known as a bubble plot, a foam plot, um, of uh, all the pathways known to reactome, uh, and it's highlighted the ones which are overrepresented in that gene set, and we're more or less getting what we expect. We're seeing uh, gene expression, signal transduction, developmental biology, DNA repair, um, cell cycle, uh, and the immune system, among other things, which are overrepresented in the cancer data set, which is exactly what we expect. And then we can zoom in on this and go down to the pathway level and actually see which genes were in our gene set and how they're related to each other. And then there's a large table underneath this of the p-value and false discovery rate um, and a lot of underlying information that you can browse through. Okay, so that's, that's gene set enrichment analysis. Okay, now we'll talk about um, de novo um, subnetwork construction and clustering tools. So these are tools in which you start with a, uh, a network, typically, um, and you apply a list of altered genes and proteins to it to identify topologically unlikely configurations. That is, in your gene uh, or protein or RNA set, is there a subset which are closer to each other on the network than you would expect by chance, because those are likely to be interacting with interacting with each other and will shed light on your biological question. Uh, then these algorithms will extract the clusters of those uh, unlikely, topologically unlikely configurations and annotate them with a variety of uh, biological annotation sources, such as gene ontology terms. So here's an example of doing this. I'm afraid this is a really old example from 20, from 2010, but still a good one. Um, one of the things that uh, Reactome has done is to take its path, curated pathway data, turn it into a network, and then add high throughput data from uh, the other, net, uh, other uh, interaction network database sources, and to do a little bit of machine learning in order to remove false positives. And so this gave us a uh, what we call a functional interaction network that has uh, 11,000 proteins and 270,000 interactions in it. It's relatively small by reaction network standards, but because we filtered it, it has a, a, a relatively low rate of false positives. Okay, and then uh, from this, we applied a, a, a set of uh, um, genes which are uh, were upregulated in um, uh, 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 in triple negative breast cancer, uh, identified the topologically unlikely configurations of those genes, and it uh, split the um, the big network into a smaller network consisting of a series of um, uh, genes which are interacting with each other frequently and have cross connections to other genes. So we clustered this into uh, a, um, a breast cancer disease module of 10 to 30 genes. Actually, I'm gonna give you, yeah, all right. So this is just a information on the functional interaction network uh, and our calculated false positive rate is less than 1% in this. Our false rate negative rate is very high, 80% because we're only covering a fraction of the gene. Okay, so here's something that you can do with it. Um, we took 52 pancreatic cancers and uh, identified their somatic mutations. And then if you just look at the, um, uh, uh, at the distribution of the, uh, of the mutations, 
uh, the K uh, 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 the KRAS gene, which is the very first one. I know this is a little crowded. Uh, you know, is um, uh, there in over ninety percent of the cancers, and then there's a very very long tail of less frequently under uh, less frequently mutated genes. Can we use the information from this tail to um, to understand more about the biology of pancreatic cancer? So when we apply that mutated gene list to um, the uh, uh, the reactome functional interaction network, sure enough, we get a uh, a series of clusters out of this. There's a big one that has KRAS right in the right in the middle, um, and it is uh, we annotated it with gene ontology terms and. We get ERB signaling and um, FGFR signaling and axon guidance is a big signaling module. And then we get smaller modules with hedgehog signaling, calcium binding, um, uh, uh, immune signaling, the spliceosome, axon guidance. These are all things which are, most of these are known from the literature. Some of them were, some of them were new, um, new processes. And then we can take the modules and we can cluster the patient samples by which modules are active in that particular patient. And sure enough, that cluster is actually pretty well. The patients are here on the y-axis and the modules are there on the x-axis. And we identified four different types of pancreatic, of pancreatic cancer, which are distinguished by which modules are active. And then we looked to see if any of these tumor types were predictive of survival or response to drugs, and they weren't. But when we applied the same method to um, uh, breast cancer, that's what I was referring to before, uh, and did the same analysis, we found a, uh, a module which is actually expressed, uh, 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 whose expression is correlated with uh, survival. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve. These are months uh, in which the patient was disease-free. And patients that have a low expression of genes in this module do better than those that have a high expression. Uh, and when you look at what's actually in here, uh, it's a cell cycle and aurora B uh, and aurora B signaling, which is associated with mitotic rate. So this is a actually a pretty good prognostic marker for breast cancer discovered through um, de novo subnetwork clustering. So here are some of the clustering algorithms that you can use. Gene mania is the easiest to use and really, really useful. Uh, and then there are um, uh, uh, there are two cytoscape apps, which I can recommend. One is called Hypermodules, and the other is the Reactome FI network, which, uh, I, we, which was used to generate those examples before. And then there is a, another very popular uh, algorithm called HotNet from Ben Raphael's lab uh, at Princeton which um, uh, uses a interesting model in which the network is, uh, um, its uh, network is represented as a metallic lattice uh, and it puts mutated or your, puts your genes of interest and makes them hot. And then it uses a heat diffusion model to find neighbors. I don't know why it works, but it works quite well. Okay. All right, now we're going to talk about pathway-based um, modeling. Here you have a list of your alter genes, and you apply them to uh, biological, uh, directly to biological pathways, not to networks, uh, in an attempt to try to discern the biological relationships. Um, and this basically uh, shades into systems, bi systems biology. We're trying to make mathematical models based on the prior information from the pathway to explain the, observa the empirical observations. So these, are, these start to get into, a, um, uh, uh, into heavy math, but uh, so for metabolomics and biochemical systems, uh, there are tools that uh, represent the pathway as a series of partial differential equations. Um, uh, one of the more popular tools is CellNet Analyzer, and it's used for meta metabolic relationships. Uh, for kinase cascades, people use the, um, use the tools NetForest and NetworkKin, uh, 
These are um, network flow models, which uh, model the flow of information through a, uh, a kin uh, through a kinase cascade and can be used to construct uh, models of, of, of kinase signaling. Uh, then there's some uh, tools which are uh, attempt to uh, reconstruct the transcriptional regulatory network based on high throughput RNA seq or microarray data to identify key uh, key nodes in the network, such as transcriptional master regulate uh, master regulators, and the oldest and still widely used of these is from uh, Arachne from um, the Califano Lab at Columbia University. Uh, and then there are probabilis probabilistic graph models, um, such as the Paradigm tool, which is from um, uh, David Hausler's lab at uh, uh, UCSC, um, which um, represents the uh, um, uh, pathway as a series of, uh, of um, uh, influence nodes where information comes into um, um, uh, one reaction and goes out to several others and using uh, a, a, a Bayesian probabilistic network attempts to infer um, how the uh, how each node will influence will influence the next the next one. So it propagates activation through the network. So here is a little look at how paradigm works. You start with a very, uh, here's an example of a very simple uh, pathway with just two genes and an output apoptosis. One's a negative in inhibitor uh, and the other is an activator. Uh, it then uh, expands this into all the steps of the, uh, the central dogma. So MDM2 actually has a gene and it makes an RNA and it makes a protein and the protein becomes active and it makes an active protein. And TP53 is a gene that makes an RNA, it makes a protein uh, and it makes an active, uh, uh, it makes a, the active TP53 um, uh, protein, which is inhibited by the MDM2 active protein. And so then it breaks this, it expands this graph into all the uh, macromolecular things and says, okay, if I have, um, introduced a mutation into MDM2, then this is decreasing the activity of the gene, which decreases the RNA, which decreases the protein, less active protein, and therefore it's going to inhibit apoptosis, which is a very complicated way of, of, see, of, of, of modeling something that you can, you can see very clearly. But when you get to large pathways, it then becomes useful. Okay, and this allows you to model multiple changes at different levels, including mutations, copy number changes, changes detected by proteomics, changes that, that, are, that are detected um, by uh, uh, post-transcriptional and post-translational processes. And Paradigm has been um, very, very successful. Um, uh, here's an example uh, in uh, understanding, bi uh, interpreting biological data. Here's an old publication from TCGA in which Paradigm was applied to uh, glioblastoma multiforme, and it very rapidly identified four different uh, GBM subtypes, which had uh, clinical um, uh, clinical correlates. So here's a question. I'm going to end with a um, uh, with an experiment designed to get at a core question, which has not actually been addressed, uh, which is. Pathway modeling sounds great, people use it, but can you actually use pathway, curated pathways to predict uh, biology? And uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I went to the literature to see if anybody had actually done ex uh, empirical experiments in which they um, made a, they, they took a pathway from a curated pathway database, stared at it, and used it in a systematic way to make predictions about what would happen when you knocked out or knocked up different genes in the pathway. And I didn't find any systematic studies of it. So the with the Reactome staff, we did this experiment. And so we asked two things. Um, if, you have a, um, if you have a curated pathway 
um, how well can a uh, expert gazing at the pathway diagram um, predict what happens when you knock out some of the genes that are at the top of the pathway? And can, a, and can an algorithm do the, if that's successful, can an algorithm do the same thing? And I know it seems obvious and you think it's gonna work, but it was never tested. So the step one of this experiment is that we selected 10 cancer related pathways that were well annotated. Um, and from each of them, we gathered key uh, input and output pairs. So uh, the curators um, decided using a series of rules that we put together, which are the key inputs that we wanted to test and which were the key uh, uh, outputs from the pathway, which indicated the level of pathway activation. And overall, we collected um, 4,968 pairs from those 10 pathways. Next, the curators went out to the literature to identify functional genomics experiments in which the key input was perturbed. One of the key, inp key inputs were perturbed and they measured the effect on key outputs. So these were things like CRISPR or RNAi experiments. And we were careful not to use papers that had already been curated into React only because that would be cheating. And of those nearly 5,000 um, uh, test pairs, uh, we found 531 papers which reported empirical results on 847 of them. Okay. Next, for those 847 cases, the curators stared at the pathway diagrams and tried to make predictions. And we had a rule book for how they would do this. We had three curators doing it. We first did an experiment in which independently they, they made predictions. We found high correlation among the three curators. And, the, and so on the basis of that, we divvied the 847 up among three different people to make their predictions. And at the same time, a talented computer science scientist in the laboratory created a simple um, uh, 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 graph-based analytic tool called MP Biopath, which basically does uh, a Boolean modeling of the pathway to make predictions um, uh, to make uh, predictions uh, uh, automatically. And this is a very simple algorithm at, at its core. All it does is it counts between the uh, the source, the input, and the output. It counts the number of positive uh, arcs and the number of negative arcs, uh, and figures out from that whether the overall effect is going to be up, down, or no change. And then it has some rules for what happens when when you have things combining and forks. Okay. So the results were actually, I think, pretty pretty good. So the curator's accuracy was 81%. So overall, 81% of the time when a gene was knocked down and it was predicted that the activity of the target would go down, they were, they were correct. Um, the algorithm, MP Biopath, was also not bad. It wasn't as good as the curator's, but it, it was correct 75% of the time. Uh, if you just randomly guessed, it would be 33%. So these results were significant. The largest, so what we're looking at here is a summary of that. The greens are true positives. The oranges are uh, false positives and the cyans are um, false negatives. Uh, the outer ring are curator, I'm uh, sorry. The, inner, the uh, outer ring is MP Biopath, the algorithm, and the inner ring are the curator predictor predictions showing that the curators are doing a little bit better than the, uh, than the algorithm. Um, when we looked at where the errors were, the largest source of errors were here, the false negatives. And uh, when we looked at those in detail, it turns out that those are cases in which a key step was missing from the curated pathway. We hadn't kept up with the literature. So there was biology missing. And the largest source of false positives was one in which the curators or the algorithm predicted that the um, that there would be a change and that it would be up, but in fact the empirical results were that it was changed, but it was down. Uh, and these also turned out to be re usually related to missing genes in the path in in the pathway, uh, where there was a a feedback loop of some sort which was changing the direction of the relationship. 
There was excellent concordance between the algorithm's prediction and the human's prediction. This is an ROC curve. How many people here are not familiar with ROC curves? Okay, one person. This is the rate of false positives. That's the rate of false negatives where we're treating the human's predictions as being ground truth. In this case, random guessing would give you this curve. Perfect guessing would give you a curve that goes up. You have zero false um, positives and 100% accuracy. So it would look like this. We're getting a fairly high um, uh, steep curve here, um, which is, uh, uh, um, uh, it can be interpreted as being 91% concordant. So the conclusion from this was that, in fact, pathway databases are useful for modeling biology, can be used even very simply for making predictions, but we need more funding to, um, uh, to do more pathway curation. That's my, my pitch when I write grants. Uh, so conclusions from uh, and takeaways. So pathway analysis allows you to discover biological processes hidden in large scale data. Um, you have uh, a plethora of databases and tools to choose from. Um, the curated pathway databases after many years are now reaching levels of completeness that allow for accurate prediction of perturbations. I'm very happy to say, and the field is really ripe for machine learning approaches because we've got all these great curated data, curated data sets and interesting relations. And so I've got, left you with uh, links to the various tools that I mentioned, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Please.